Season two of The Wheel of Time is over. And now, rather than breaking down a single episode one at a time, we can take a look at the whole season, answer the most simple of questions. Was it any good? Before we get into the review, if you don't mind, take a moment and give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy Wheel of Time related content. A good percentage of you that watch these videos are not subscribed and you're gonna miss all of the coverage of season three as well as tons of book lore videos and breakdowns of this past season. Let's talk about season two. I think it would be a bad idea to begin talking about season two of the Wheel of Time without first starting with season one and where we were at coming into this season. Season one was up and down with some high highlights and some serious low light. But the general consensus was that the sum of the parts was not as good as some of those individual parts. Season one didn't always work as a whole. And by and large, for a bunch of different reasons, COVID, actors leaving, delays, a VFX worker shortage, all of those were reasons. But season one ended on a down note. Now, season one was by no means terrible. I recently rewatched it and there are some very strong moments and some strong performances. But it wasn't what I and many other Wheel of Time book fans had hoped for out of the first season of the show. The final episode of season one left us with a lot of serious questions about the future of the characters as well as the direction that the show would take. Which brings us to season two. After almost two years of waiting, I would be lying if I said that I was not nervous for what we were going to get and for the future of the TV show. The streaming environment, apart from even Amazon alone, is not in a great place right now. The writers were on strike, the actors are still on strike, and great shows on all platforms are getting canceled left and right as the crunch of monetization on streaming services has been felt across the industry. You couple that with the poor reception to the end of season one, and we are at a place where, in my opinion, if the first few episodes did not hook new viewers or leave a good taste in people's mouths, then it was possible that Wheel of Time would tank as a show and end after season three. And while that is certainly still a possibility, I am far more hopeful than I once was as the reception, both critically and among fans, has been large largely positive. The show, unlike after season one, is actually gaining momentum rather than losing it now that it's over. This is the complete opposite of what happened at the end of season one, and it bodes well for the show's future. So that's the context, but let's break down the season. Was it good? Was it bad? Do I think the season was a success? Unlike season one, was it better than the sum of its parts? Well, as with all of my reviews, let's start with the things that I loved from the season, and there were many. First of all, I want to call out the performances. Some may call it hyperbole, but I watch a lot of shows, movies, and I'm very critical. I actually have a movie review channel. I'm intrigued by the skill that it takes to put together shows like this. So it's always very interesting to me. And I'm again, I analyze how well they do. Wheel of Time has one of the best ensemble casts with some of the best performances I've seen on a TV show. And that is not to say that all of the performances are standouts, but there are so many standouts. It's actually shocking for a TV show. Madeline Madden, Zoe Robbins, Rosamund Pike, Forrest Forrest, Natasha O'Keefe, and Kate Fleetwood would all be deserving of Emmy nominations if they received them. Clearly, they all will not get them, but I wouldn't be surprised to see any of them get nominated. It's an embarrassment of riches, in a sense. And it only gets better next season because they're adding Shori Agadashlu. But the actress that stood out to me all season, in a season of standouts, was Kate Fleetwood as Leandrin. Yes, she was written extremely well, but Kate Fleetwood acted the shit out of Leandrin and made her very relatable, but still evil. She was believable as a character when she could have been cartoonish, and every little expression on her face told a story. I think it's also worth mentioning for season two that it was just an overall upgrade in quality. Almost everything was better. The writing, the set design, the color grading, the cinematography, the number of locations they shot in, and most of all, the size of the world. Season one suffered from feeling small in a show that should have felt huge in scope. Season two did not have the same fate. We had so many different locations that were done so well, again, for a TV show. They all felt distinct, they felt different, and the show made great use of their budget. The scope of the season truly felt epic, and it showed in the non-reader reactions to the show. The visual effects also improved massively in season two as well. Channeling specifically got an upgrade, and the use of colors to demonstrate the different flows of the one power was what many fans, including myself, were hoping for in the first season. It gave added depth to the channeling, and it told a visual story to fans that may not have known what was happening or the complexity of channeling. The other special effects were also outstanding 
happening, including some of the practical effects. And while it certainly is not a Marvel or Star Wars movie or show in terms of visual effects, it was certainly impressive for a fantasy TV show. In terms of storylines I loved in season two, there are a number that stand out to me. And the best storylines, in my opinion, were the White Tower storylines, specifically that of Egwene, Nynaeve, and Leandrin. Getting to see the White Tower in the Aes Sedai was really awesome, and the White Tower felt actually large in size. That wasn't the case in season one. And I hope they continue to expand upon the size and scope of the inside of the White Tower as the seasons progress. Nynaeve's storyline was great at the beginning of the season, with her time in the arches being an absolute highlight, as well as her on-screen interactions with Leandrin. Egwene became a highlight towards the end of the season with her captivity, the interactions with Renna. That was done so well, and it's such an integral part of Egwene's development as a character. I really need needed that to be impactful for me to end up liking the show, and I think it was. Leandrin was just a delight. I never knew that I would love watching a villain as much as I did her. She was relatable, but also awful. I loved her and hated her at times. I empathized with her. Her actions felt impactful and believable. Which I think brings me to another strength overall of the season, and that was almost all of the villains were done well. The Forsaken, specifically Lanfear and Ashamael, were done spectacularly. They felt like their book versions, and their actions actions while evil also felt like they made sense and they were far from being mustache twirling villains. It made them compelling and they were one of my favorite parts of the season. Some other plot lines I enjoyed in the season were every single scene we got with Varen. She was fun. It felt like Varen and admittedly she did get off to a slow start for me. I wasn't convinced after the first two episodes but once we got to the tower she felt exactly like Varen to me. Mira Sile did amazing. Kyrian was also fun to see. The introduction of Olvire as Maureen's sister was a good idea. Yeah, and it was actually compelling, and I love how they've set that up for future plot lines there. In general, the future seasons of the show are very well set up by this season. The pieces are in the right places, and they have overcome the rocky ending to last season, but that doesn't mean I loved everything. So let's talk a little bit about what I did not like this season. And I really wish I could say I loved every part of it, and that it was without major flaws, but, but I can't say that. As I've done with my other reviews, I will try to separate some of my criticism here. As a book reader and massive fan of the books, I would be lying if I didn't say that every single change like struck a blow to the inner part of my being because I want to see ultimately a word for word adaptation of the books I love. But I'm also pragmatic and I know that can't happen. I could make an entire video with all of the choices in adapting the story that I don't agree with or that I don't think were done well and it would probably be a 40 minute video on the subject. But I have to come back to the idea that I can accept plot changes but I want the heart of the story and the characters to be well adapted. And while I think they did that for the most part, I also think that non-readers don't notice those changes, and they seem to love the show for what it is. But there are some choices that I think were particularly bad or were just poorly done. So that brings me to the non-plot adaptation criticism. There are things that were just not done well. And let's start with what I think were some poor payoffs. Pot on Fane, Lord Ingtar, Moraine, and Lan, the Dark Friend Social, none of those felt like they paid off well to me. There was setup, there were plot bits and pieces that were introduced, but the end product was rough rushed along, and it didn't have the impact it could have. I would be willing to bet that there's probably a minimum an additional 20 minutes, at least on those characters that was filmed and cut, possibly even an hour worth. There are very obvious places where those scenes were cut to where it's really glaring. For example, Perrin shows up in episode one to see the girl that got away from Pot and Fane in his vision, only to see her him carrying her shirt in the next scene. Obviously, there was something cut there where he found that. I think Ingtar's sacrifice had some major stuff cut in the final episode for time. Maybe they felt like it hadn't been earned. Because of this, though, none of the scenes that we did get made as much sense as they should have, and the characters and any development that they may or may not have had was completely lost. This shows up a lot to me in what a wasted character pot on Fane was. He's not currently following anything like his book plot, and that's a shame because I think his book plot actually adds a very cool element to the story. We never got any resolution or any explanation about how the group of people attacked in the throne room in the end of season one as pot on Fane was stealing the of Valir, how they all survived, including Loyal, who was stabbed with the Shadar Logoth dagger. Uno was stabbed with a Murdral sword, but we just kind of yada yada past that. 
And speaking of that, how did Pot on Fane get the dagger? When did he get it? Is he attached to it like Matt was? It doesn't appear to be. He was easily able to part with it and just give it to Matt there in the final episode. Again, these things aren't major problems, but they're losses on what could have been to me. I think they fell into the trap of needing to keep their A-listers busy as well, so they manufactured a plot line for Moraine and Lan that I frankly hated. I know other people love it. I hated it. Mostly because I think Lan had a very boring plot line that lasted way too long during this season at the cost of some of the other things that I've mentioned here. I think there was better stuff they could have come up with to give Moraine and Land something to do in the story. It really is just too bad to me. And I think Matt had a similar treatment. I think they were stuck having to rewrite what was going to happen to Matt after Barney Harris left the show. So they had to write their way out of the predicament last season. And the majority of his scenes this season were set up to, again, get him where he needs to be, but they were just slow and boring. He had an amazing moment in episode eight, and I think we could have had more fun out of Matt throughout the season. So I think there was just some misses there. Rand is another disappointment for me. The writing is extremely inconsistent around him as a character. In a rush to make all the characters important, Rand has not gotten the moments that the other powerful characters in the show have had. Rand is the most powerful channeler to ever live. And while he's not nearly at the peak of his power at this point in the story, neither was Nynaeve last season in season one. But she had her explosions of power. Rand had a number of those that should have happened this season, but we never got them. I loved getting everybody together at the end, and I would have loved to see them all face a Shamael together, but Rand needed to play a larger part than that. It was far more anticlimactic than it should have been, and Rand needed his superhero moment, and he didn't get it. And I'm sure they will show his development and growth in future seasons, but I need a glimpse of it like we got with Nynaeve in season one. The season in general, I would say, had a lack of focus. This is a criticism that's actually harder for readers to see, because we all know where the story was headed. One criticism I have seen from non-readers that I agree with is they weren't sure what the plot of the season was headed towards. There were a lot of episodes to them that felt like nothing happened. And I can see that. And it, I think it started with how weakly done the Dark Friend Social was at the very beginning of the season. That should have been setting up the plot for the whole season. And it was so vague where when we were seeing that all happen through the girl's eyes, we kind of missed what was really happening there. In general, though, most of the issues as I see them outside of the plot changes I didn't love can be chalked up to only getting eight episodes. I think it's lost on people what they are trying to accomplish with this and how difficult it is with only eight episodes. Game of Thrones got 72 episodes for its run for the five books and that covered 1.7 million words. Now if you assume that the remaining books in the A Song of Ice and Fire series will have a similar length to the other ones then the total series is going to have somewhere around three million words. I'm being generous with that. That would break down to about 42,000 words per episode of the show or about seven episodes per book. Wheel of Time has almost 4.5 million words, and it's getting eight episodes per season, not 10. So if we got the same run of seasons that Game of Thrones did, which would be eight seasons, and I think we would only get seven at most, but we'll take eight for a moment, then we're looking at 64 episodes. That's 70,000 words per episode, or roughly four episodes per book. That means significant changes are going to be needed, and just by giving the series 10 episodes per season that Game of Thrones got, that would actually get us back back up to seven episodes per book like Game of Thrones. So enough with the math. Wheel of Time needs more episodes, Amazon. You have a great story on your hands. Let them tell it. So let's bring it all together and give a rating for the season. This was a vast improvement over season one. I enjoyed every episode. And while they weren't all bangers, they were all pretty good television. If I base my rating entirely on how closely they adapted the books, it would be pretty low. If I base my ratings on how well I enjoyed the season as a television show and how much it felt like the Wheel of Time to me, I would give the season a much higher higher rating. While in season one, I felt like the season was worse than the sum of its parts. As I look back, I think season two is about equal to the sum of its parts. I'm going to give season two of The Wheel of Time a 7.5 out of 10. Did I get it right? Let me know what you think in the comments of the video. Again, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to check out all of the Wheel of Time content that I have on the channel. There are hundreds of videos. Huge thank you to my patrons for making this channel happen. I could not do this without you. If you would like to support the channel, consider checking out the Patreon. Patreon in the link in the description of the video. And lastly, if you liked this video, I guarantee you, you're probably going to like this one here too. Thanks for watching and until next time, peace out.